Today we must continue to speak about the five khandas, the five aggregates. We need to look at this, or we will continue looking at this from some angles and in different aspects which we haven't looked at yet. In order to understand the burden of life, we need to understand the five khandas completely. So please bear with us, be patient and determined to follow with us as we continue talking about the five khandas. We must know these khandas as clearly as we know the different objects and furniture within our house. In our house we can see everything there very clearly. We know where everything is and we know what, exactly what it is. We must have this same sort of clarity about the five khandas. Just talking about them or listening about them is not enough. Writing notes in a notebook is not sufficient. We have to clearly see these five khandas to see the body aggregate when it is functioning. See the vetana or feeling aggregate when it is performing its function of of partaking of a feeling of liking, disliking, whatever. There is the sanya aggregate, the perception aggregate, when there is the activity or function of, of remembering, of discriminating, of perceiving the marks and signs of an object. The sankara aggregate, sankara khanda, the thinking, and then the last aggregate, vijnana khanda. We must know these five khandas the way we can know the fingers on our hand and see them clearly the way we can see each of the fingers on our hand. They're distinct. Each of the five is distinct. And we need to see these khandas this clearly if we are to understand the burden of life. Sometimes in our awareness there is only one khanda. Sometimes we are only aware of the body. There are times we are only interested in the body. And in that moment there is only one khanda. At other times in the awareness, there are only the four nama khandas, the four mental khandas, vetana, sanya, sankara, and vijnana. Sometimes there is only interest in and awareness of these four mental khandas. Then at other times, in awareness there are all five khandas. There is interest in the complete set of all five of the khandas. This we can, we can examine and observe within our own awareness. We can, we can pay attention to this. You see, sometimes we're only interested in the body, the rupa khanda. Sometimes there is only interest in the mind the four mental khandas and sometimes in all five khandas. In some of the commentaries on the scriptures of, of on the words of the Buddha, not this isn't <clears throat> there are interpretations of this teaching of the Buddha that there are different worlds or realms and in one realm, the beings there have only one khanda. So there is this, this explanation of what the Buddha said, 
starts talking about some other world somewhere where the beings only have one khanda. And this has been accepted and is now very firmly believed by many devout traditional Buddhists who believe in all kinds of heavens and all kinds of hells and different worlds all over the place. There's another world, these people think, where the beings have only four khandas, the four mental khandas. And so these are, this is some world or realm or sphere or something where the beings have only mind and no body. And then there is this world with which we are all very familiar, or we at least ought to be familiar with it. And that is the world or realm of the five khandas. We generally are possessed of five khandas, but sometimes we're only aware of one, the rupa khanda. There are times when we're aware of four, only four, Vetana Khanda, Sanya Khanda, Sankara Khanda, and Vijnana Khanda. And then there is also times when we are aware of all five, the complete set of the Khandas, which, whether we're aware of and interested in one Khanda, four Khandas, or five Khandas, is completely dependent upon the conditioning of the mind. However the mind is conditioned in that moment, that conditioning will determine the awareness of one, four, or five khandas. We've heard already how these five khandas are the thing we call life. We've discussed this adequately and so we already understand that life in the five khandas are the same thing. Now I'd like to talk about three different kinds of five khandas. There are f three different kinds of khandas. Each kind is made up of five khandas. There are the five khandas, these five groups, when attachment has not arisen. There are moments when no idea of I or mind arises in the mind, and so the five khandas in that moment are free of attachment. There is no clinging to them. There is no movement in the mind that is saying, I am body, I am feeling, or the feelings are mine, the thinking is mine, the perceptions are mine. There is, this attachment has not arisen. This is the first kind of khandas, the khandas where there is no attachment. We can call them the mere khandas, the mere khandas. There's just these khandas, no, without being without any additions, without the extra addition of attachment. The second set of khandas are the groups of clinging. And this is when the mind is conditioned in a certain way so that there arises the thought of I. I am thinking. I am the thinking. I am the body. I am the awareness or the thinking is mine, the feelings are mine. When this attachment of I or mine arises towards the khandas, we call these the group of clinging, the groups of clinging or the upadana khandas. Upadana means attachment. So the upadana khandas are the aggregates of attachment. When this happens, then there is this weight and burden is placed upon the five khandas. And so the khandas become very, very heavy through this attachment to them as I or mine. The Buddha said that when he 
in his first sermon when he was explaining what dukkha was, he summarized all dukkha by saying the five upadana khandas are dukkha. So the five, this second set of khandas is what dukkha is all about. Attachment to body, feelings, perceptions, thinking, and bare awareness. This is the meaning of dukkha. So there's the first set when attachment has not arisen. We can call these the mere khandas. Then the second set when there is attachment is the upadana khandas or groups of clinging. Then there is a third set of five khandas. This is the set of khandas that arises or that is maybe I should say remains after one has practiced meditation and developed and trained the mind. Once the mind has been developed high enough so that attachment no longer arises, once this conditioning of attachment has been cut off, then there remain five khandas. And these are khandas where there is no more and never again will be any attachment to them as I or mine. These are the five khandas of the Arahant. We, these five khandas, these pure khandas, are found in the Arahant, the enlightened being, the perfected being. This is the meaning of perfection, to, to remove the attachment so that there are only pure khandas remaining. So we have these three kinds of khandas, the mere khandas, and these, these, are, these are happening in our experience. There will be moments when we are truly at ease, when there are no weights or burdens on the mind. These are moments when the mind is free of all attachment. That's when there are the mere khandas. And then there are the moments that are conditioned where there are the upadana khandas because of attachment to each, to the five khandas and to each of the khandas. And then last of all is the third set, when attachment has ended, when dukkha has been ended and there only remain the pure khandas of the perfected one, the arahant. So these are the three different sets of khandas which you ought to know about. Through the practice of vipassana, the mind is developed to a degree where there is no more upadana towards the five khandas. Through this development of the mind, there is no more attachment to the five khandas. This is the result of the practice, the correct practice of vipassana. When we say vipassana, we're not talking about a certain way of sitting, a certain way of walking, going to the toilet, or a way of playing with your breath. We're not talking about any physical activity. Vipassana is the clear seeing of the way things are, the clear seeing of the nature of reality. When there is this seeing, then there is vipassana. Through vipassana, the mind is developed and developed to the degree where the attachments cease. And then what remains are the pure khandas of the enlightened mind, of the arahant. The minds of most beings have moments of cleanness, of lightness, of calmness when there is no attachment to the five khandas. But then there will arise attachment to one of the khandas, to this khanda or to that khanda. And then the mind is clouded and darkened and burdened through this attachment. A mind that is still has the potential for an attachment is a mind that is not yet pure. It has not been developed fully. 
the practice of vipassana has not been completed. It may be occurring, and so the mind is being cleaned up. But until the practice of vipassana is complete, attachment will continue to arise, and the second group of five khandas will will still happen. There will still be the groups of clinging. But if vipassana is carried to completion, if this is done properly and fully, then there will be the pure khandas where there can never be any more attachment again. And then the mind is truly at peace, truly calm and undisturbed, whether it is walking, sitting, talking, listening, or whatever. These activities can go on, but there is no attachment to any of the khandas, and none of, no attachment to the activity of the khandas. This is the result, this is the fruit of the practice of vipassana. So we want you to understand this so that you know why you are practicing meditation. You're practicing meditation to, so that there will be vipassana, and through vipassana, this fruit of the ending of the burdens of the aggregates of clinging, so that there are only the pure aggregates remaining. This is what vipassana is about, and we point this out to you so that you will have the motivation and desire to practice. If you have this strong determination and desire to get rid of this burden of the five aggregates of clinging, if you truly are tired of this burden and want to put it down, then you will put sufficient energy into vipassana. So we want you to understand the fruits of vipassana so that you will be able to give it the energy and determination that is required. It all comes down to the question of attachment or non-attachment. This is the issue, whether there is attachment to the khandas or there is non-attachment to any of the khandas. This is the central point. What's interesting here is that when attachment arises, the thing that attaches is the same thing as what is attached to. We usually talk about the five khandas as the things attached to. These are the objects or bases of clinging. But when we ask what is it that attaches, what clings, it's the same thing. Specifically, it's the fourth khanda, sankhara khanda, the thinking aggregate, which clings. When there is misunderstanding and a wrong kind of thinking arises, this is attachment. Attachment is just a form of wrong thinking, confused, misunderstood, thinking that is conditioned by misunderstanding or ignorance. This is what attachment is. Sometimes this fourth khanda, this attachment, will go and attach to itself. It will attach to thinking. Thinking attaches to thinking. Or sometimes it will attach to one of the other khandas. This, this wrong kind of thinking will attach to the feelings or the body the perceptions or the bare sensual, the bare sense awareness. Or sometimes this sankhara will go and attach to something external. It will attach to the khandas 
of some other being. So it will attach to external khandas as well. So it's just the khandas attaching to khandas. This is what it comes down to. And then there are khandas where nothing is attaching to them. When there is attachment, dukkha arises. When there is no attachment, no dukkha arises. And so the question of attachment is central to our problems and to this, this thing we call dukkha. But all that exists are the khandas. But sometimes they are ignorant khandas that are attaching to themselves. We've talked about what is attached to and what attaches, the same, which is the same thing. Now we'd like to talk about the forms attachment takes. Generally, we can speak of two kinds of attachment. There are two different forms of attachment. The first is the attachment to something as I, or the Pali word is ata. To attach to something as the self, as I, as me. I am this. This is the first form of attachment. The I am this, the I, the ata attachment. The second kind of attachment is attachment to things associated with the I. And in English we usually call this the mine, mine, M-I-N-E, attachment. I am this, that is mine, that is mine. This is the second kind of attachment. So the two forms of attachment are I and mine. This is how we translate it in English. The Buddha used the word ata. Ata is that feeling or th thought of some separate individuality which I am. That's ata. Ataniya is the second form. And we want to explain this a little bit so you don't misunderstand what is meant by mine. Ataniya means dependent on the I or dependent on the ata. Or we could say related to, associated with the ata. This is ataniya, the second form of attachment. For example, there is the ata. I. And then the children, the wife and children of the Ata is Ataniya. The wife and children are dependent on the Ata. So that is the my children, my wife, or my possessions, my car, my house, my clothes. This is Ataniya. Sometimes it goes so far as that there is the ata attaches to itself as myself. So there is the the ataniya attachment which is dependent on the ata on the I can attach to itself. So the I attaches to itself as myself. But still, there are these two basic kinds of attachment, ata and ataniya. For example, life. Generally, there is the attachment of ata towards life. I am, I am life. I am this kanda, that kanda. I am the kandas. But often we attach to it as my life as well. The ignorance is so is confusing us so much that we we can't even make up our minds about our attachments. And so we attach to it as my life. Or the life I am the I am my life is how it how complicated it can get within our confused minds. But basically there are the two forms of attachment the I and mine attachments. 
attachment to some to atta, an attachment to ataniya, things which are dependent on the atta or the self. When the there is this natural occur naturally occurring level of attachment which we call atta and ataniya, I in mind. This is kind of an instinctual attachment that happens within all sentient beings. But when this basic instinctual level of attachment is conditioned by gilesa, by defilement, when the defilements come into play, then this attachment is much stronger there can be a much stronger degree of attachment. And the Buddha had a separate set of words for this, this cruder, coarser, more strong and fierce level of attachment. These words are ahangara and mamamgara. Ahangara and mamamgara. In Thai, there's a convenient word to express this. There's the word gu which is a crude personal pronoun. In English, we just have the one pronoun, I. But in Thai, they have many different pronouns that mean I. Some of them are very refined, such as Chan, very polite, and others are very crude, the way GIs talk or something. And so Gu is a very crude level of attachment, very strong and defiled attachment. And then there is Kongu, or what, what is possessed by the Gu. So this, this is an, a stronger level of attachment. In English, we can't think of words to, dis, to really translate Ahangara and Mamamgara like we can translate into time. All we can think of is I and mine. So there's the I and mine attachment that is on the naturally occurring instinctual level. But it also has, this attachment has levels and degrees. It can get stronger and stronger and stronger. And so if we had different kinds of I, a more subtle I, and then stronger and bigger, cruder forms of I, we could express this easily, but we only have the one pronoun, I. But the attachment has degrees and levels, depending on the amount of ignorance that is conditioning the mind, depending on how much gilesa or defilement is involved. So there are still, there's basically the two kinds of attachment, but there, it's, there's also a matter of degree and strength within that attachment. If you can think of some words in English to express this, we can have I in mind as the basic level. But if you can think of words for the stronger levels of attachment, please let us know. So the matter of degree is of interest and importance. There's the normal level, the, or the, the ordinary, natural, instinctual level of I and mine, of, of atta and ataniya. It's attachment and it causes dukkha, but it's not a particularly powerful form. But then, through if this, this instinctual I is let out of control, if it's not kept within control, it will get bigger, fatter, it will become proud and arrogant. And so then we can maybe for now call, say that there is the arrogant I in the arrogant mind, the proud I such as Lucifer when he was shaking his fist at God and trying to take over the show. We can have this much stronger, prouder, arrogant 
level of attachment of the arrogant eye and the arrogant mind. These are much hotter, much heavier, and stir up a lot more dukkha. So we have these two, two sets, two pairs of words in, in Pali, ata and ataniya, eye and mind, and then ahangara and mamamgara, the arrogant eye and the arrogant mind. Ajahn Buddhadasa has left it up to me to find out the best words to translate this into English. He already did it for translating it into to Thai. And anybody who wants to help me is, is welcome to. But don't get caught up just in the level of words in this discussion we have going here about the levels of attachment. Because the real place to study these is not in the lecture hall or in your notebook, but is in experience. The real place to note these is in the awareness within one's own mind. There is where the attachment is taking place. It's not taking place theoretically. It's taking place in actuality. And so to observe that, be aware that sometimes there is a kind of ordinary, regular kind of I in mind. It's not very strong and it really doesn't, it doesn't disturb the mind a whole lot. It's not completely peaceful, but it doesn't drive the mind crazy. Ordinary, sane people are able to function fairly well with this level of attachment. It brings dukkha, but not usually real, horrible, terrible dukkha. But usually also there are times where this natural I in mind, this ordinary level gets out of control. It becomes proud and arrogant. It gets caught up in defilement. And then it's much hotter and heavier and fiercer. And much more dukkha arises out of this. And this is the dukkha that can really mess up our lives. This is the kind of dukkha, this is the arrogant eye that can go insane and really has problems in life. Watch these levels of attachment. See the many different levels that attachment can happen on. Basically, we can talk about the, the ordinary level in the really strong, fierce, arrogant level. But there are many gradations, many degrees. And you can observe these as they happen within your own awareness. That's the place to study within the mind, not within the talking. So be aware of these. Because if, for a beginning, you can at least keep this I in mind under control. Keep it from getting too fat and too arrogant. That will eliminate a lot of useless dukkha by just keeping this under control. Now, keeping it under control means there is still this illusion of I in mind, of Atta and Ataniya. But the dukkha conditioned will, by that attachment won't be so terrible. But still there is dukkha, and so we need to eliminate this atta and ataniya as well. Once the, the attachment to I and mind is eliminated, then there will be no more problem with the arrogant I in the arrogant mind, arrogant mind. So essentially the practice of Dhamma is is eliminating this illusion, this misunderstanding that leads to attachment to things as I and mine. And then there will not be the cruder and fiercer levels of attachment, which we call ahangara and mamamgara. So we have these two kinds of attachment, the I attachment, atta, and the mine attachment. Ataniya. If we examine both of these 
we will see that each kind of attachment has a result or a fruit. The result of the I attachment is selfishness and the result of the mind attachment is also selfishness. The result of both kinds of attachment are selfishness. When we have the I attachment, there are, with this feeling of I, this attachment to I has a, leads to a kind of selfishness where one is unwilling to give in in any way. One will, cannot be humble. One cannot accept anything. So if we're discussing something with someone, no matter what, we cannot accept what we're saying. Our own pride and arrogance is so strong that we can, we only stick to I, 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 I. And we're unwilling to accept or listen with an open mind. This is the arrogant, the I has, leads to an arrogant kind of selfishness, which is very bred, prejudiced and biased. This is the kind of selfishness that makes it impossible for us to agree, to have conversations where we are truly open and listening to each other. It's this kind of selfishness that prevents communication, honesty, friendship between, between human beings because of this, this kind of attachment leading to this selfishness. And even the highest levels on this planet, where the, at the United Nations, where there is supposed to be occurring agreements between nations, where nations are supposedly working together for peace, because this selfishness is so strong, this arrogant, selfish atta att attachment is so strong, that they're often unable to make any agreements or the agreements that are passed are so wishy-washy as to have very little meaning. There are always passing resolutions that mean almost nothing because nobody can give up this attachment. There's so much selfishness that, that everybody is too much sticking to their own position. And so there's this kind of selfishness interfering on all levels of life, in our personal lives and in the larger scales of world politics, where this selfish attachment, where this arrogant selfishness interferes. With the mind attachment, the ataniya, where we attach to some thing as mind, then it is the kind of selfishness when, where we're unable to give it's mine. I can't give it to you. <laughs> there is this kind of selfishness where attaching to things is mine. We cannot give them to others. And so this is another destructive kind of selfishness. So many, so much of us is trying to possess things and accumulate things and keep them. And we're unable to give things to others. And this also causes much harm and damage, not only in our own lives, but in the world around us as well. So we can see that both kinds of attachment lead to selfishness. There are these two kinds of selfishness, the arrogant I kind of selfishness and the, the stingy selfishness that comes from the mind attachment. In fact, both kinds of these attachments, it's really just attachment. It's just one kind of attachment. But to understand it better, we can talk about the different forms it takes. And so we, we're speaking about this to make it most clear to you. This, this selfishness, this arrogant selfishness and this stingy greedy, miserly selfishness are things that we can see very clearly in our own lives, in our own minds. And so 
we talk about it in this way to help you study it in your own lives where these things ought to be most clear if you don't see them clearly then make it clear do what you have to do to see these things clearly so that you understand and will be willing to do something about the situation actually these two forms of attachment work together or we could just say it's the same attachment you can say it's the same or that these two kinds of attachment are so closely associated that they're inseparable we talk about it often in terms of two forms of attachment but we can just as well talk about it as the same attachment to show to explain this when the i arises then there arises the mind there's no mind without the i but almost always the mind will arise with the i or right afterwards for example when the i is born in the mind when the i comes into the mind then there will be there will be my illness my aging my death because of the birth of the i then there is also my my this my that usually illness or actually illness go, growing old and death are just natural processes they don't belong to anyone or anything they're just natural occurrences but when the i is born in the mind then there is also the mind and the mind is attaching to illness as my illness growing old as my growing old and death as my death so this is how when the i arises it starts accumulating things so the i attachment is almost always associated with the mind attachment atta and ataniya are really inseparable like this we can't really take them apart we can't make a clear separation between them it's basically the same attachment so sometimes if we only use the word self or atta you can assume that within that we're also talking about the mind attachment the ataniya so when we say not self we're also saying not mine not i not mine so when we use sometimes since we don't have a lot of time we don't always go into complete detail when speaking so sometimes if we say just ata we're also meaning ataniya i and mine so these are to this is how the attachment is basically one attachment its attachment is always the same but we can also talk about it having the form of i and the form of mine now we come back to the khandas or rupa khanda the first of the five khandas rupa khanda the corporeality aggregate or materiality aggregate sometimes we just say body body aggregate this is rupa khanda so here we are with this body this physical material thing we call a body and then there is the i attachment arises and clings to the body as i i am the body i am this body there is the i attachment on rupa khanda and then the i wants to use the body for some something it wants it has some something it wants to get from the body and then we have the my mind attachment arising 
It's my body. And so we have these two kinds of attachment arising towards the body. The body as I and the body as mine. They arise almost together or together. And so with the Rupa Khanda, we can attach to it in these two ways, as I and as mine. This, there's the I that thinks, there's the kind of thinking that identifies with the body, and then the kind of thinking that wants something out of the body. And so it has a mind, my body, for me to do with as I want. Also, there can be attachment to external bodies, things associated with the body. These can be attached to as well. So this is attachment to the body. In this way, the body or corporeality, materiality, is made into something heavy. The attachment is a burden and it turns the body into a burden. And this is how the body becomes a burden of life, a burden upon life through the attachment to it. On the other hand, when there is no attachment, the body is not a burden in any way. This is the thing that you need to observe within yourself. Observe the arising of this attachment Look carefully and see when there is attachment to the body as I, when there is attachment to the body as mine, or when there is attachment to external objects as mine. Be aware of this, the working and activity of attachment, so that you see it clearly. And then you'll understand how, how, un <clears throat> how terrible and heavy the burden of life is. So whenever the attachment of I arises, whenever the I is born, there automatically comes with it the attachment of mind. There is this double attachment or double illusion taking place. For example, with the body, there is attachment to I, the body. And then also the body becomes mine because the I is arising through. With the I, there is some kind of craving involved and it wants something out of the body. And so the body is mine for me to use to get what I want. So the I in the mind, this double attachment is taking place. Or with the feelings, there is, there is some feeling about a sense object, liking, disliking, or uncertainty. There is feeling taking place. And then there is attachment to the feeling is I. The ignorant, because of ignorance, ignorance is attaching, is ignorance is conditioning attachment. The ignorant mind cannot just feel it must have an I who feels. The mind that doesn't understand the way things are is always looking for the, the I. It's always asking who feels. It's always trying to find the I and is always asking who. So it takes the feeling and makes it into I. I am feeling or I am the feeling. And then this ignorance also leads to the attachment to my feelings. The feelings, instead of there just being feeling, there begins the, there arises the attachment of I, who am feeling, and the my feelings. And so in this way, there's this double attachment arising. Or with perceiving, with sanya, when there is perception of male or female or tall, short, or some kind of memory, some remembrance, when the sanya khanda is functioning, instead of there just being perceiving, 
There must be the I, the perceiver. Ignorance is caused, is conditioning this attachment again to perception. And so there is I, the perceiver. And this I has my perceptions. And so the, what is just an activity is personalized through this attachment and we get this double illusion of I and mine. I the perceiver and my perceptions. The same thing happens with the thinking, with sankara kanda, the activity of thought is taking place and then who is thinking? Oh, I'm thinking, I think, my thoughts. And this is what is exemplified by the famous quote by Descartes, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. Just because this very clearly shows this attachment where because of misunderstanding this thinking is assumed to be an I, the thinker, and the thinker has my thoughts. So I in mind are attaching to thinking. The double attachment happens with each of the khandas and with the vijnana khanda, the bare awareness of sense objects through one of the six sense doors, through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or mind. There is this vijnana, this knowing of the sense object, the sense stimuli. Stimuli. And this is attached to as I who know, the knower, and my awareness, my knowing, the things I know. And in this way, with each of the five khandas, there's this double, this two level, or two tiered, or double story attachment taking place of I and mind. Maybe if there was just the I attachment, it wouldn't be so heavy. But there's the I and then the mind comes in on top of it and really weighs things down. We're really putting a lot of weight on these five khandas through attaching to them as both I and mind. Always this double attachment. Please don't believe what we're telling you or memorize things in books as if you were going to go have to take a test somewhere. What we're telling you here isn't for you to pass any examination which you would do on paper. This is all about passing the examination of life, which means eliminating dukkha. To, ta to pass the exa this examination of eliminating dukkha Book knowledge is of no use, and what we're talking about is of no use. To eliminate dukkha, you have to see this as it's happening in your own life. So we talk about it here to aid you in studying the attachments that are really happening. The attachments we talk about is is just the words about it. But see the real thing within the mind. Study these and see them clearly. See how each of the five khandas is burdened by this double-barreled attachment of I and mine. And see all the dukkha that is conditioned because of that. Now don't think that there are just these five things to attach to. And so it must be eager, since there's only five things, we must, it must be quite easy to control this problem of attachment. When we usually talk about the five khandas, we talk about these five things we've been talking about so far. But we can also talk about a group of 30 things which go by a different name 
but are still basically the five khandhas. So we have an, a group of 30 things which are called the ayatana and things associated with the ayatana. The ayatana are the sense spheres. So these are the sense spheres and their associated things. And so we have a group of 30 things which are still basically the five khandhas. So to explain this, we have six, this 30, these 30 things are made up of five groups of six. The first group of six are the sense organs, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. When the eye sees something, there is often attachment to the eye, to the eye, this eye. The letter I attaches to the, the sense organ I. Or maybe we're interested in what the ear is listening to, and then there's attachment to the ear. Or there are some interesting odors coming to the nose, and we attach to the nose, I am the nose. Or there can be attachment to the body, the skin. Somebody hits us, and we say, don't hit me. We attach to the body, sense organ. Or there can be attachment to the, the mind, the sense organ, when it's, it has a thought or an emotion or something. We can attach to the mind as I. So the first group of, the first of these groups are the sense organs. The second group is the sense objects, which we can also attach to as atta, as self. The sights or forms and shapes that are seen, these are, can be attached to as I. Or the sounds are attached to. Smells that come in through the nose. Tastes, flavors that are sensed with the tongue and mouth. Touches, or and lastly, ideas and emotions. These six things can also be attached to, the six sense objects can be attached to as I. The third group is what we call patsa or contact. When the I sees a form or a shape. There is contact between the two. And this can be attached to. This, this contact between sense organ and sense object can be attached to. Whether it's between eye and form, hear or ear and sound, nose and smell, tongue and flavor, body and touch or mind and thought or emotion. These contacts between sense organ and sense object can be attached to. The fourth group of six is the awareness of the sensing, the sensory awareness, which is the basic knowing of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, or thinking. And then the last group of six, or with that fourth group, this is vijnana, this awareness of each of the six kinds of sense activity. And then lastly, the, sixth, the fifth group of six things are vetana. There is Vetana, there is I Vetana, a feeling towards the I experience, the visual experience, feeling towards the hearing experience, the activity of hearing, or towards the, the object of the hearing. This all can be attached to. There can be attachment to smelling, or to what is smelled or I'm sorry, their feelings about the smelling can be attached to. 
feelings about tasting, touching, and about thinking, or feelings about the emotions going on in the mind. These are all things that can be attached to. We have these five groups, the sense organs, sense objects, sense contact, sense awareness, and then feelings. And these five groups are, are divided according to the six ayatana or sense spheres. So there we, now we have 30 things to attach to. Really these 30 are no different than the five khandas. But when we realize that there are these 30 things, then you see how easy it is to attach to all these different things. There are all these things happening and it's so easy for the mind that is conditioned by ignorance, by the mind that lacks correct knowledge, to attach to one of these 30 things. So this attachment is going on all the time. We often talk about attachment to the five khandas, or we can give it a different name and talk about attachment to the 30 spheres, the 30 sense spheres and things associated with them, the 30 ayatana. We use different names, but it's still basically, it's still attachment to the five khandas, but there are different ways of describing it. So don't let the different names confuse you. What's being talked about is essentially the same thing. Actually, there are more than 30, if we want to look at it this way. 60, 100, 200, how, however many we want to see it. We could take, we talked about these 30 things. After, after the feelings, there is sanya, perception. And we can talk about perceptions regarding the eyes, ears, etc. So six kinds of perception. And after perceptions, there are, there's intention, an intention arising in the mind, intention to do this or that. This attention, there are six kinds of intention, and then desires, and thinking, and all kinds of stuff. So there are many, many different sets and groups that are arising in this whole thing. And so we can talk in terms of 60, or 100, or 200, or how many ever we wanted to. We could go on and on with this, but we're afraid that you would fall asleep. So we're not going to go into all these tens and hundreds and thirties and everything. The point is that we can talk in terms of dozens or hundreds or whatever, but no matter how detailed and how much we cut everything up into little groups and categories and lists and all this, it all comes back to the five khandas. We can go into incredibly exquisite detail on all these things and it might you might all fall asleep or at least not be able to follow what we're talking about but the essential beginning point of it all are just the five khandas so we're not going to go into all these details and those of you who have been or will be reading books about buddhism if you read something by some professor somewhere who's all caught up in the detail, don't let it confuse you, just bring it back to the five khandas, because that's where it's all happening. So from now on we're going to be talking in terms of the khandas. This is, we'll keep things fairly simple. We can talk in very, in great detail if we wish, but it's still talking about the same thing the khandas and attachment or non-attachment regarding the khandas. We'd like to summarize everything that needs to be said about the khandas with a very, very special quote from the Buddha. And Ajahn Buddhadasa just recited it in the Buddha's language for you. This is very meaningful 
passage and it's, pl- it's put in verse. And here at Suan Mok, every morning the monks chant this within the chanting service. It's one of the most meaningful of the small chants we do. And in fact, it's been translated in, and the translations for it are around here someplace. I don't know if anybody has seen them, but it's been translated into English as well. Here at Suan Mok, when we chant, we chant in Pali first, one line of Pali, and then the Thai translation but we've also got some chants where it's Pali and English. So we will go through this chant in Pali and explain it to you. Actually, it's not a chant, it's a, a short poem which the Buddha recited, which is now chanted by many monks. The first line of this, Para Hawe Panjakanta, means the five khandas are burdens. Oi. Oi means something like for sure. With it's like an expl maybe in English it's just better to use an exclamation point. But it's the five khandas are heavy burdens for sure. The Buddha, in this line, because it's a verse, he had to make things fit, so he only said the khandas. Don't misunderstand this. What he's talking about in this case is the five upadana khandas, the second set of khandas where there is attachment, the groups of clinging. These are the burdens. The khandas where there is no attachment are not a burden. But the full meaning of the word khanda, especially as we sentient beings are concerned, is the upadana khandas, the aggregates or groups of clinging. Without any clinging, these things are no problem, but they become these burdens once there is attachment. So the first line is the five groups of clinging are heavy burdens. Why? Why? He said this interjection, why, why, is being used when speaking to foolish or stupid people. <laughs> the next line is Paraharo Jabukalo, the person. This means the person, the individual. And the carrying or the per- the person and the carrying of the heavy burden. So when we talk about this person and the carrying of the heavy burden, this word person should be put in inverted commas or quotation marks because there's no real thing. So that we there's no real person. This is that ata again, that I. The person is another illusion. It's another figment of the attached mind. Through attachment there arises this person. Without attachment there is no person. So we ought to put this word person in quotation marks so that we realize that it's just an illusion. It's this illusion of a person, of a self, of the Atta, that carries this heavy burden of the five Upadana Khandas. So through the, with this second line, Hara Haro Jabukalo, the heavy burden and the one who carries it, the person who carries it. The It's only through attachment that this person arises. And so there can only be the carrying of the burden with this when there is a person. And there's only the person when there is attachment. So it's it's very clear and obvious that all the weight and burden that we carry around with us in the mind, that the mind carries, is 
is being carried by this this idea or self this idea or illusion of self is what carries the burden around the next line is para tanang tukang loke para tanang tukang loke which means the carrying of of burdens is dukkha is tuka in this world mm-hmm. or we can also say the carrying of burdens in this world is tuka we can translate it either way and to look at this more carefully this means that dukkha comes into the world we bring dukkha into the world through through the carrying of these burdens and so dukkha takes place in the world and the carrying of these burdens is worldly is a worldly thing for the for the mind that transcends the world that is no longer caught up in or attached to the world there are no more burdens and so dukkha takes place in the world through the carrying of burdens in that world when the mind is free of the world and no longer trapped within worldly conditions then we say the mind is beyond or above the world and that and then there is no burden the burdens take place in the world and that's where the tukka is as well we can summarize that by saying that tukka is only in the world of fools tukka <laughs> is only in the world of fools the next line is para nike panang sukang to toss away to throw away the burdens is bliss or is happiness to throw away all the burdens is happiness and the meaning of this line is that when there is when there are only intelligent people then there are, is no dukkha in the world but fools take upon themselves mm-hmm. all these burdens when there are wise intelligent beings then there are no burdens taken up and there is only bliss the throwing away of burdens only happens in the world of of intelligent ones or intelligent beings and when we say the world of intelligent people or wise people the the name we usually use for this is above the world to we can call it the super mundane realm or the ultra mundane realm or whatever so when we say the world of intelligent people we're talking about transcendence of of the the world of fools transcendence of the world of duality this is the world of intelligent wise people where the the burdens are thrown away niki pitawa karung parang niki pitawang karung parang anyang parang anadiya anang parang anariya the meaning of this is once the burdens have been thrown away don't go and pick up any new ones once you've thrown away once these burdens have been tossed away mm-hmm. don't pick up any new burdens you laughed but when we say don't pick up any new ones this is what we're constantly doing we're always picking up this one we put it down we pick up another one put it down pick up another one so even when we manage to put down one of these burdens the mind goes and attaches to something else and picks up another burden so this is why 
we have to be reminded once we let go of something once it's tossed a burden is tossed away be careful not to replace it with a new burden toss away the old burdens and don't pick up any new ones the final two lines are samulang tanhang apuiha apuiha means nichato parinipputto pulling up craving craving is ignorant desire desire conditioned by misunderstanding pulling up craving by the roots complete with its roots is the end of all fires and is tranquil coolness so the pulling up of craving by its roots is great is the end of fire and heat and is great peace and coolness when craving is completely pulled up then there is no attachment attachment is conditioned by craving and when we say pull up craving by the roots it means pulling up the causes of craving as well which is ignorance or avicca so by pulling out the roots of craving then there is no more attachment when there is no attachment then the fires of the defilements go out the defilements are very very hot they're constantly burning and scorching the mind but when craving is uprooted then the fires go out and there is and what remains is nibbana nibbana is coolness it is spiritual tranquility this is what remains with the end of these fires and when we no longer the mind is no longer carrying these burdens we'd like to emphasize that the lines or the words the end of fires and complete coolness does not mean death when we say total coolness this is full nibbana but nibbana is not death we're not saying coldness coldness is death but coolness is not death coolness is between the extremes of fire and ice or heat hot and cold coolness is what remains this is not death there are still the five khandas but these are the pure khandas without any attachment there's no more ignorance to condition any attachment to the khandas so the khandas are cool life is cool the khandas are still there and they still function they can carry on all the functions of a what we call a sentient being but now that is done without any attachment so it is the functioning of an enlightened being and this is coolness so there are the cool pure khandas this life is only the pure cool khandas there are no more of those heavy burdensome khandas that come about through ignorant attachment the defilements greed hatred and confusion are hot attachment is hot being a slave to the defilements is hot carrying the burdens of the groups of clinging is hot being a slave to the vedana is hot all these things are hot they are fires which burn the mind when all these fires go out when these fires are extinguished this is coolness coolness is the going out of all the fires and this coolness is the meaning of nibbana we'll go through it one last time without explanations just the, the basic meaning the five khandas are heavy burdens fools the five khandas are heavy burdens 
<laughs> or, or hey, stupid. Stupid. <laughs> the five khandas are heavy burdens. That per, the person is the one who carries these heavy burdens. The carrying of these burdens is tuka in the world. Throwing away those burdens is bliss. Once you've thrown away these burdens, don't pick up any new ones. Pulling up desire, completely, pulling up desire completely by its roots is the end of the fires and is total coolness. Would you like to all say that once? Chorus. We'll, we'll do a chorus of it. All of you, recite it with me. Parahawepanchakantha. Parahawepanchakantha. Paraharojapukalo. Paraharojapukalo. Parathanang tukang loke. Parathanang tukang loke. Para nikhe panang sukhang. Para nikhe panang sukhang. Samulang tanhang apui ha. Samulang tanhang apui ya ha. Nicha to pari niputo. Nicha to pari puto. So this verse can be used like a mantra. As is used like in the Tibetan Buddhism, so you can use this as a mantra because it has a lot of meaning. If you're going to use a mantra, you should use one that has meaning. So you can use this as a mantra, or if you like to sing songs, you can sing this. Especially every time there is attachment rising, you can start to para haro. And so the attachment will fade away. I'll type this up and put it on the bulletin board for anybody who would like it, with the Pali and an English translation. So this is a summary of the situation we're in with the khandas. All this attachment and this burdens is occurring in the mind. When we talk about the khandas, there is the body and the mind. Or in Pali, we have the word jitta, which is usually translated mind, or mano. There are some different words for this. When we talk about the khandas, we we have four khandas which make up the jitta or the mind. And this is vetana, feelings, sanya, perceptions, sankara, thinking and vijnana, sense awareness. So we have these four khandas. This is the mind. The reason there's only one body khanda and four mind khandas is because the mind is much more complex. And as we've been discussing, that's where the problems are happening. When we talk about this relationship between body and mind, we can compare it to a company or a business. Life is a business, and there's the body, which is the the activity of the business. The mind is the manager of the business. If there's a good manager, the business will turn a profit. If the manager is stupid, the business will go into debt. So the thing for you to do is to look at your personal little company and see if the manager is wise. Or stupid. Are you going into debt? Are you picking up all these burdens, or are you turning a profit? Is life free, cool, and useful? If you find out that the manager is stupid, then fire him. 
kick him out and find a wise one, find an intelligent manager to take over the business. The business is to be a human being, not just an everyday common fool. The business is to be a human being. And to do that, we need a wise manager to run the business. If you can't find a wise manager, then you're just going to have to take that stupid one and train it. Train the stupid manager to be a wise one. Train it to learn from its mistakes. Every time it makes a mistake, it learns the lesson and doesn't repeat the mistake. Turn it, teach it to let go of the debts, to let go of the burdens, and to only do what is profitable. So if you fire the, the stupid manager and get a new one who, who is wise, or else train the stupid manager so that the business will function properly and will turn a profit, which means it will be a human life and not just ordinary sentient bumbling around and running into dukkha. So this ends today's talk and we will close our meeting here with a song. Haraha we panjakhantha Haraha roja pukhalo Haratanang to Kang Loke Haranikepanang to Kang Nikipitawakarung Parang Anyang Parang and Samulang tan hang apui ha, nichato pariniputo, nichato pariniputo. So that's it for today. Make sure you learn the words by tomorrow because every time we begin, we're going to begin with this song and then we'll close with it as well.